Welcome to Artist and Critic. I'm Don Gray. We're continuing with our <coughs> excuse me, series of programs on women subjects for artists. We're calling it the Eternal Woman because we are exploring symbolic qualities of womanhood, of femininity, the feminine principle in life, if you will, as viewed uh, primarily by male artists at different periods in our history. Last time we closed looking at a uh, print by Rembrandt. Uh, I'm fairly certain of his wife Saskia. It, it looks a great deal like her and as we know she died a relatively young woman after giving birth to three or four children, uh, most of whom died uh, within three to four months of their birth. Uh, their son Titus was the only one to live to adulthood and he died tragically in his early 20s. And this amount of death within his family was a, a great uh, trial for Rembrandt. But we see woman, again briefly, as being used up, being worn out, uh, literally sagging, collapsing, uh, the life just simply draining out of her. And while Rembrandt is obviously going for the most graphic realism, he's uh, unflinching in his perception of the figure, uh, it does uh, talk about the, uh, mm, shall we say it, the temporary nature of life itself for both female and male, the temporary flowering of feminine beauty, if we want to stick simply to the feminine since that's our basic theme, the, the, the tragic uh, chasm of eternity that lies under everyday reality when we think we're going to go on forever unchanged and unchanging and uh, when suddenly one, uh, one year we're five years old, then we're 20, and then we're 72, and we're lying in our deathbeds. Uh, life is something like that, uh, Rembrandt seems to be saying to us. And uh, the problems of life, the problems of, of womanhood uh, can be seen graphically in this ceramic sculpture of Ella. <coughs> by uh, Carl Walters, uh, executed in 1927. It's in the Museum of Modern Art, if you would care to see it, if they have it out on exhibition and it's not downstairs someplace. We see uh, a woman, uh, heavy set, obviously it brings to mind a sports writer's uh, comment, description of Herman Franks, the former giant manager, as being entombed in fat, and, and we sense uh, the, the vulnerability of the woman, the uh, mental suffering. Uh, in past times, uh, fully rounded figures we, uh, in primitive times were meant to suggest fertility and, and uh, there were many fertility goddesses. We think of the Venus of uh, Willendorf, uh, which I don't have a slide of, unfortunately. <laughs> but here, this picture, instead of seeming to express that, expresses personal suffering, of being different from other people, of, of having a weight problem. And she clutches a picture to her breast, and it's extremely difficult to see, but the picture itself seems to be a picture of herself, perhaps, or another heavy-set woman, and she stares blankly into the distance, suggesting that uh, nothing can be done, nothing to be done. A similar uh, quality, perhaps, although not uh, as desperately suffering as Ella, is Larry Rivers' double portrait of Birdie at the Whitney Museum. The woman, again, suggesting age, uh, use by life, uh, the body collapsing, falling in upon itself, just the opposite of of any symbolic fertility symbol, any youthful sex symbol that might 
creep into an artwork, either consciously or unconsciously. Uh, Birdie accepts herself, seemingly, accepts her physical status, accepts her age status, uh, just as Larry Rivers seems to accept it with great um, levelness of attitude. Just the, the simple fact that Birdie, Larry Rivers' mother-in-law, at least at that time, uh, in 1955, would let her son-in-law paint her and paint her with such uh, steadiness of, of reaction, such uh, ease of interaction, speaks uh, volumes for bo both their character. Of course, the feminine principle, the, uh, the woman, can be seen in many different ways, and we have a rather uh, humorous, I think, representation by Rene Magritte, in the uh, Belgian surrealist in 1947, uh, entitled Philosophy in a Boudoir. And, <laughs> and uh, perhaps uh, making uh, his joke about the boudoir being the place where emotional intimacy, sexual intimacy takes place, and here he is uh, perhaps attempting a philosophical statement of it. The breasts are present in the nightgown almost as if a memory of the breasts that uh, pressed the fabric when they were worn by the woman. We look at the shoes at the bottom of the picture, and of course her toes are still present in the end of the shoes. The metamorphosis of a foot to shoe, and uh, it becomes a, uh, at least as, as I see it, and I, I don't pretend to uh, know exactly what Magritte had in mind, but it, it, it certainly is a, uh, an amusing uh, visual imagery. And, uh, well, we, we won't go any farther. We won't go any farther with that. Um, looking at the female version of this, we look at Marisol's, uh, oh, I'm sorry, we have Salvador Dali first, Venus de Milo, Venus de Milo, with drawers. And we see this famous statue, the uh, statue of the goddess of love, segmented, uh, turned into a filing cabinet, if you will, perhaps reflective of 20th century bureaucracy, uh, categorization, and the mechanization of society, where the breasts themselves become individual drawers. Here we have Marisol's picture called The Bathers. And this is Marisol's joke on uh, bathing beauties. The one with the yellow hat in the foreground seems to be Marisol herself. The features, her facial features, say, uh, are very close to hers. I don't know about the rest of the anatomy. When we look at her, her buttocks, uh, very uh, <laughs> smartly and uh, amusingly created out of, I, I don't know exactly what it is actually, but some sort of capping device that, that express, that accentuates the roundness of the buttocks in contrast to some of the wooden angularity of the rest of the structure. Related to Picasso's wooden structure, some of his other sculptures and paintings, we have the eternal female. Um, superficialized so that uh, she becomes more a caricature. This, the, the female principle that, that has been depicted so many ways in painting and sculpture through the millennia becomes a little closer to a cartoon, perhaps reflecting our own superficiality in our age, our own inability to reach deeply into life itself and therefore unable to create symbols that have any weight. We go back to in the late 1890s and we look at Aubrey Beardsley's uh, drawing, ink drawing of a woman uh, called the Black Cape, done from the series uh, on Salome. And we see the late 19th century uh, Art Nouveau 
twisting movement that we discussed in an er briefly in an earlier program. She becomes almost this um, hardly human, this tiny little head that we see uh, underneath the hat, or the, the, the immense uh, collar and shoulders of the garment sweeping down to the rest of the, of the dress makes her seem almost like some uh, frightening insect or bat of some sort. The buttons on the wide breast seem almost like eyes. And she, reflecting Beardsley's own attitudes and the tense, nervous, uh, darkly suffering attitudes of the late 19th century moving into the 20th. Beardsley will die at the age of 26. The suffering of, of woman, the suffering of the feminine principle in our time, approaching our time in Renoir's painting of the Loge, in 1874, we see the male and female ostensibly together as monks meeting in infinity last time, or Kakashka's The Bride of the Wind or The Tempest, where the male and female are together, even though they seem little aware of each other as they're being ravaged by their time. Here the woman suffers in herself while the male separates himself by looking outward and elsewhere with his binoculars. It's as if Renoir, in some very acute fashion, is telling us that not only are women themselves being ignore, ignored or misplaced or abandoned in life, they're not allowed to develop to their full potential, but the feminine principle. The principle, if it isn't uh, a, too much of a stereotype, of the receptor, the giver of emotion, the giver of life, uh, sympathy is being ignored, is being minimized in our time. And of course leads to Picasso's The Young Women of Avignon in 1907 and so many other uh, literally, literally abortions uh, created in the 20th century where woman and man have been uh, distorted and destroyed. But, but it may be very significant in 20th century art that woman has been by far the greatest subject matter of artists and woman and her figure that has had to bear the brunt of artistic distortions, lacerations, and uh, finally elimination as art became totally abstract. And uh, I think we're not only seeing in, in this the attack on women themselves, as many uh, liberationists would agree, but also the symbolic idea of the feminine principle as the, uh, rep the symbol of nature, the giver of life. Life has been held very cheap in the 20th century. Uh, a lot of it has been destroyed in war and out of war by societal attitudes, by uh, uh, simply environmental uh, corruption and poisoning, bureaucratic corruption and poisoning. Look well, what Gauguin does with poor little Belle Angel, his landlady in Brit Brittany in 1889. This provincial woman, he places Natalie attired in her, her costume of the area, but closed in her little semicircle from the rest of the magnificently glowing living world, the primitive world that Gauguin longs for, symbolized by the idol to the left and the flowers above. The, but the woman figure is, is, is channeled, controlled, the female figure placed in her own little box, so to speak. What does Cezanne do with Madame Cezanne in the conservatory at the Metropolitan Museum in New York City? Uh, someone uh, spoke recently to me of her being uh, literally clad in iron. Uh, that that uh, her garment, her body, 
So it does seem almost like she's made out of iron. As Cezanne struggling not only with the relationship to his own wife, uh, they were lovers for many years, finally they got married, but by the time they got married everything had died anyway, so that they lived uh, at least as much apart as together after their marriage. Uh, Cezanne is talking about his difficulty with women here, generally. He always longed to paint nudes out in nature, but he was too repressed, too shy, too hung up, to use a scientific term. Um, and perhaps Madame Cezanne represents his own uh, restricted feminine feeling, his own uh, emotionality that he doesn't quite know what to do with. This isn't to take anything away from the painting. It's a great painting. It's, it's powerfully molded. It says something of womanhood, woman as eternally surviving, as eternally bearing all burdens, as poor Madame Cezanne sits. Uh, I'm sure Cezanne is saying to her, you know, don't move, don't move. Does an apple move? And she simply stares back and, and hangs on for, for dear life until this obsessive husband of hers gets through with his, his painting. Manet's bar at the Foley's Berger. Look at the figure of woman here. Uh, not free, not representing the fullness of life, the free flow of life, uh, the barmaid trapped behind the bar, uh, melancholy, isolated, alone, even though she presumably waits upon a customer out here in the viewing audience where we are. Part of her sadness comes from Manet, I'm sure, who is uh, deathly ill, increasingly ill, at the time this is painted and will die two years later. This probably is his last large picture before uh, the effects of syphilis on his nervous system so weaken him that he can only paint for minutes at a time on small pictures, basically still lies before throwing himself to rest on his studio divan. So that we see woman uh, representing not only herself and a scene that Manet has, has visualized and been a part of many times, but we also see woman as life herself, rec life itself recognizing its limits. The fact that it does end, and Manet's will end. Similarly, in a picture by Edgar Degas, a very beautiful one at the Metropolitan, very meticulously painted oil, woman with chrysanthemums, we see woman Nature, representing nature, the flowers are the woman, the woman is the flowers. And we see the woman in reality somewhat nervous, somewhat tensely biting her finger, chewing on her lip, thoughtful, looking away from the flowers, looking off the side of the canvas, while the flowers boom and burgeon and explode like fireworks at the marriage of Prince Charles and Lady Diana. How's that for bringing in a little bit of contemporary <laughs> history here? We try to keep you entertained. So that one senses here, not only uh, one realizes, not only woman is the source of life, is life, is nature, the feminine principle, but we also see uh, a sociological, psychological study by Degas that allows us to sense or think that the woman is suffering, limited, and repressed, perhaps as Madame Cezanne is, or Cezanne was himself, and we see her wanting to explode, perhaps, like those blossoms, like those flowers. Maybe, we, maybe there are a lot of women like that these days. Uh, otherwise, why would there be so many soap operas during the day? that offers uh, a, a lurid menu of sex and violence and uh, sex 
and violence and sex and violence. What Irene did to Ted and what Melba thought of Oliver's doing it to Irene and, and how um, Edith uh, scratched Helen's eyes and Helen went to the hospital and we see her wrapped <laughs> in bandages for several weeks. Uh, and of course all of the gothic romances that are advertised on television and, and uh, Mary, is it McPartland in England, the queen of the gothic romance, makes millions from these uh, sexual adventures that end happily ever after. So it, it's uh, that those sell and that the uh, soap operas are so popular says something about uh, our lifestyle, the way we live, uh, repression of our lifestyle, and a repression of the female principle, if we want to get uh, symbolic about it again. The, the force of life, the force of fecundity, of not necessarily uh, uh, childbirth and so forth, but just simply the upwelling of feeling and the expression of feeling. Rembrandt's Bathsheba, we see a, a suffering woman suffering, and she holds in her hand the note that summons her to King David, and she will have to be unfaithful to her husband because King David orders it, and we see the sense of, of sadness, of a woman caught in a destiny not of her own making, um, but perhaps because she is a woman, uh, her destiny in certain situations is to be taken advantage of, although how many times are men taken advantage of in many situations? As Rembrandt's Bathsheba contemplates her faith, fate, if not her navel or her faith, we watch Picasso's woman contemplate her image in the mirror <clears throat> at the Metropolitan Museum. If painted in 1932, this, the woman on the left is Marie Therese, the Swedish woman, <clears throat> blonde, and Picasso gives her a face like the sun, glowing yellow on one side. <clears throat> but not particularly sexual, as, as we said before. There are round breast forms, there's a round pelvic and uh, belly forms, <clears throat> but not particularly sensuous or, or sexual. And we ask what has become of the feminine principle in this particular picture, it seems divided, it seems split, and there seems to be a relation between a light side, excuse me, and a dark side, the image in the mirror. We look at the relative wide-eyed innocence and wholesomeness in the expression in Marais, Therese's face on the left, and we look at the dark, darker colors, the red forehead signifying passion in the reflection in the mirror, the squeeze bulb of green shape with the red nipple on the forehead that seems to suggest a certain nervous pressure or tension. And we have the queen of the day and the queen of the night, the queen of up, the queen of down, the queen of good, and the queen of suffering, the queen of beneficence and health and joy on the left, and the queen of, of night and darkness and suffering and despair on the right. We see in a classic symbol the meeting of, of opposites, the two sides of not only woman, but of life, of nature itself. There's birth in life, there's death in life, there's joy in life, and there's pain in life. I wonder if in the picture coming up in Renoir's Woman with a Cat painted 50 or more years before this, we don't have a, a, a similar symbol, an interesting relationship between the woman and the cat, two sides perhaps of her own personality. Uh, was Renoir aware of this when he painted it? Did he do it intentionally to suggest a, a certain soft gentleness in the expression of the head? 
or as opposed to the, the darker feline qualities of the cat, uh, perhaps even approaching a kitten, but somehow not seeming particularly warm or friendly, a certain pulling away. We look at the eyes of both of them, and we see the woman's eyes and eyebrows have a certain feline quality in them, in them themselves. We go from one of their eyes to the others, and it's as if they're twins, two sides of the same woman. Renoir is too sensitive an artist not to have recognized that, uh, at least unconsciously, and he was a very uh, conscious individual too, and I'm sure he was uh, aware of what he was doing. Uh, we see the woman contemplating her own feline nature, her own animal nature, her own sexual nature, can we say, her own unconscious side, which we all have. Let's keep this thought in mind, the last two pictures, and we go to the next one by Edouard Manet again. We look at another Manet called the St. Lazare Railroad Station, painted a couple of years before Renoir's picture in 1873. And don't we have a picture <clears throat> of human suffering? Uh, we're talking about women. Don't we have a picture of the containment of the female again? We could look at it from a socio sociological point of view in terms of, of uh, lack of equal status for women, lack of the vote, lack of equal pay, uh, being trapped in a marriage of convenience perhaps. And of course, uh, the bars are extremely important in this picture. And it's as if, of course, it's a mother and child waiting for the uh, certain train to come in. Who knows, maybe they're going off, they're waiting for the husband, the father. But the way Manet has painted it, so strangely, the, well, when we look at the, the girl from the back, the daughter from the back, just the way she is painted in relation to the bars, there's something frozen, something rigid, something ghostly about it. And we realize that what Manet is doing is, is giving us a subtle message, a psychological message perhaps, that the girl holding the bars is another aspect of the woman. <clears throat> perhaps one part of her that hasn't been fulfilled, that, that wants to reach out, that wants to go through to the mist given off by the train to find her true destiny. We'll continue our exploration of the eternal woman on the next Artist and Critic. I'm Don Gray. Thanks for being with me. Bye-bye.